Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to take uh, 20 minutes to uh, explain um, Armis's uh, value in the world of, uh, of cybersecurity. And so we're going to talk about how organizations need uh, a solution for good risk management uh, during these times of digital transformation. I want to spend one slide on talking about what Armis is. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Armis is an agentless device security platform. Our goal uh, is to discover um, every device in the environment, whether it is a legacy IT device, an OT device, an IoT device, whether there is strong patch management or, uh, or update uh, abilities for the, for the device, for the platform, or whether it is a unmanageable, unagentable device. Um, once we've done this, we do this in real time. It's continuous. Um, it complies with all of the uh, NIS uh, legislator about having uh, mature cyber security operations. Um, we are able to, uh, tap network environments in a passive manner. So it is at zero risk to any critical devices. We are very often used in healthcare and critical uh, manufacturing systems. So we don't induce any risk by sending any traffic to, to uh, critical systems. And it's an extremely frictionless approach. So we can deploy literally in a matter of hours uh, and cover the vast majority of the estate. When we've given someone a complete picture of their actual environment, they are then able to mature and make better informed decisions about how they wish to manage their estate. So this is the secondary phase of analysis. And we can tell people exactly what the device situation is in terms of its network behaviors, in terms of its firmware levels, uh, in terms of the risks and vulnerabilities that it is suffering uh, or, or liable to. And then we can take actions, whether they be autonomous uh, or automated, or whether they're part of a integrated SOC workflow process. The reason Armis exists is because of this stat, this, this chart. You know, I would imagine I've, I've been on a, a few of these uh, webinars now here, and they're all extremely valuable content that's being presented but the majority of them are related to the green traditional IT environment. You know, okay, you've got an OS, you've got to apply something on it. You've got to apply an agent in order to have a level of security, but this is quickly diminishing and dwindling as, as, as the majority of our technology estate. Um, Gartner have said 25 plus billion devices by the end of next year. Forrester have come out and said 40 something a billion devices by 2025. And you can see, you know, our, our technology estate is growing every second between the cloud adoption to different connected devices, providing new digitally transformed services. Um, it's a very, very difficult thing to apply robust risk governance to that type of attack surface. We all know how to do this with IT. We've all got our you know, ISO 27,000 or NIST or whatever the framework is that you want to apply information security. And we all know that these risks, um, uh, uh, you know, appear in either a, a, an attack to confidentiality or integrity and or availability. And we all know how we're going to state and measure what is an appropriate level um, of security to those three sort of fundamental pillars of risk. We also know that those three pillars of risk manifest in a very broad spectrum of threats. We're all very focused on cyber attacks, right? An exploit coming off a website, a document, an email, and uh, you know, uh, getting onto a Windows laptop, which then moves in the Windows environment and then a data breach occurs. But that is very much only one very small piece of the picture. Often now organizations face risks and encounter losses from cyber incidents 
through a very wide spectrum of threats. Shadow IT is one of those things. Should those devices be in that environment? Has this business unit set up a service but hasn't considered security right? as an inherent part of the process? Configuration errors we see a lot. Are there holes in the firewall? Right? Are there default accounts on systems? Um, as we go around this chart, um, we are being scanned from malicious actors for thousands of different vulnerabilities incessantly, you know, at every second of the day. We have to accept that sometimes our best practices are not as good as we'd like them to be. We have legacy systems, we have legacy protocols, and we have to work with them. So we need to understand where our vulnerabilities are in terms of state-of-the-art practices. Um, and I'll, I won't go through everyone, but of course, privacy uh, is again another uh, 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 threat that manifests itself in, 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 in different ways uh, from, from different situations in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a many different um, aspects of service delivery. So when we look at our attack surface being split between the green, the yellow, and the red types of connected devices, and we look at where of all our investment is in terms of risk management, we can see that we have a massive blind spot. Right? So we are very invested in our legacy IT environment, but for the very same risk, the lack of confidentiality, integrity, or availability, we are completely vulnerable to if it falls outside of that arena. And so Armis seeks to address this disparity. It, this, this type of disparity is not new, right? So risk governance that is limited in scope has even existed in the IT realm, right? Equifax um, were rated a triple C, which is poor by Morgan Stanley Capital Investments um, because their data privacy security policies were limited in scope and not applied to all the various risk assessments and risk scenarios that Equifax was subject to. And the inevitable thing happened, they were compromised through a risk scenario that was outside of their existing privacies and policies. And so Armis uh, in Europe is working with the World Economic Forum's approach to advancing cyber resilience. That is really the goal now for any organization is to be resilient to this ever-changing you know, cyber threat. The World Economic Forum place five questions, five key questions that organizations should ask themselves and look at how they can improve to advance their level of cyber, um, cyber resilience. The first question, how would your organization effectively incentivize risk-based improvement in cyber resilience practices instead of a compliance-based approach and develop an, uh, outcomes that enable organizations to move up the cyber mat maturity ladder? Well, of course, applying risk across your entire estate, across every device that you own, is one way to incentivize risk-based improvement because now you're seeing the full picture. Um, how do you measure expected likelihood and impact? Well, are you doing things in a continuous manner? Right? You know, how often do you get a visibility into the types of encounters and activities? How do you know if your organization is getting a positive return? Right? How do you know when you know, your estate, when something new pops up on a particular network, or when do you actually get to see the type of security that you've applied to that? Is there a lag? Is there a gap between uh, your estate and, and the level of security that you apply to it? Um, and I won't go through the five questions, but Armis exists to help you answer these five. Right? We will engage with you and give you a before and after view of your level of cyber resilience. Um, and that in, will allow you to measure the delta and allow you to predict exactly the gain in the level of security that you have achieved. So when we talk about connected device risk, 
we think about, you know, what's at stake, what type of examples, you know, how are any kind of uh, connected device causing harm, causing risk in, in the real world, in public? And we can see here that uh, this is from, a, a, you know, an aviation example, but there are many different types of assets and devices that, that form an aviation system from maintenance drones, baggage handling robots, um, you know, you know, various uh, booking systems, uh, catering equipment, the, the smart smart thermometers or you know smart ovens or whatever they might be. But uh, everything now uh, is uh, essentially um, dependent on the level of security from its other connected um, um, associations. So if we look at how devices have been used as uh, cyber levers in various aspects. We look at how um, flight information display systems were used in a geopolitical sense. And so this is a dispute between Vietnam and China about the ownership rights to the South China Sea's islands. And so a pro-Chinese group um, looked at the Chinese investment that the two main Vietnamese airports had made uh, and decided to exploit a backdoor in these systems to take out uh, all of the, the flight information data and cause the huge out outage to the Vietnamese air traffic. This led Vietnam to change their policy and to look at where they would use particular manufacturers of devices in critical systems going forward. When we think about all of these IoT devices that popped up in you know, all areas and all aspects of our business, there's no end to the type of smart thing that now exists. With regard to manufacturers of uh, Chinese uh, product, um, you very much need to check the user license agreement to see whether the product you've got is actually operating uh, in guidance with uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, policy. Um, and, and part of this EULA is very much behind the discussion about whether some makers or some manufacturers should be used in sensitive parts of, uh, of uh, government networks. In terms of uh, devices that are now being used in, in, in industrial espionage, um, you know, the classic example of uh, targeted spear phishing, um, compromising, compromising a device uh, and exfiltrating the mail spools is known across many, many different types of APT attack. Now we're seeing devices being used as sort of the same, it's the same game, but it's the next level. Uh, and so we see here Draytech uh, routers um, that instead of having to compromise the target, they just compromise the device in the middle and then we're able to exfiltrate all of the email data between all of the target victims, the entire organization um, and their third party supply chain and, and conversations. OT devices increasingly being targeted because they're, they are the business, they are critical to the business. In this example, we can see two things. Um, we can see one a cry that took out the uh, operating system, the SCADA system of a rail network. And the second one is where um, onboard satellite uh, communications were hacked uh, for actually planes that were in the air uh, from the ground um, because of uh, default credentials that were used in those, in those systems. If we think about our airspace, right? if we think about you know, what devices are just in our offices and our homes and uh, you know, in, in our various buildings and you know, how do they connect? Ericsson have produced a report which they estimate that of the 22 billion IoT devices out there currently, 15 billion of them, 15 billion of them have a radio. And so again, this is unaddressed risk um, there are now some government findings and, and recommendations about how enterprises and corporates should start to really monitor their airspace for the devices that uh, they are present with. And if you want to have a go, 
just download a little free app onto your phone. This is BLE scanner, Bluetooth low energy scanner. And you can see, you know, around you how many devices it's possible to pair with and connect to and share data with. And so again, this is very much a blind spot for enterprise. Um, shadow devices are now increasingly being used. Uh, this is an example where corrupt employees installed um, wireless, uh, wireless net um, access points into AT&T's headquarters uh, for the purposes of uh, sending um, pin codes for stolen phones. And they were able to uh, basically unlock and sell over, uh, I think, 2 million phones over a five, five year period. And this premise of you know, rogue devices, um, again, is, is something which organizations have almost no ability uh, to detect. Um, this example is from the port of Antwerp, where a, a mafia, a drug mafia group um, were loading their product into legitimate containers in South America and then shipping that product into Antwerp. Um, two of the crime gangs uh, members pretended to be um, investors into a cyber, cyber security organization and over months um, made them realize that in fact they were organized crime and they blackmailed them uh, to actually breach all of the customs functions and the bonded areas of the port of Antwerp. Um, how they did it was they, they hid radio devices inside um, what would be normally uh, safe looking devices. So they hid uh, radios inside power strips, they put USB um, uh, devices in the environment uh, and then they would sit uh, on the outside of the bonded area with an antenna and listen to the Wi-Fi traffic, extract the pin codes from the, uh, from the shipping containers, give the pin code back to the organized crime gang who would then enter the pin code. The, um, the crate would then be delivered to their truck, which was waiting for them, and then they would drive away. Um, and, so, and so this method of infiltration is, um, is very effective and it's very often not talked about or spoken about. We see these devices growing. Um, so this looks like it's a USB charger, it's not. This uh, extracts Microsoft wireless keyboard uh, strokes out of the air and then sends that to, uh, to uh, an operator. Uh, this looks like an iPhone cable. It's not, again, it has a radio inbuilt and it can uh, intercept um, data between the iPhone uh, and, the, and the laptop. This device was created uh, to actually trundle, trundle into a building and hide in a corner. Um, and if you visit the Armis website, we have a great video where we take a smartphone fly it up to the 27th floor of a building and break into a wireless access point. Um, and, so, and so these type of rogue devices um, are uh, indicators of extremely serious security incidents. Um, there's often a trend where, you know, APT groups uh, really create the method for attack and it filters down uh, over time into more mainstream criminal groups. Uh, and we can see here that basically towards the end of 2019, uh, in terms of inbound threats, uh, targeting IoT devices became the number one threat um, because they are almost impossible to secure if they're listening on a default port with a set of default credentials. And so I thought I wanted to show you some findings from some of our customer engagements where, and, and the different things that we've been able to visualize. I'm hoping that I'm conveying that Armis is extremely device centric in the way that we do things. And because it adds immediately another level of context uh, to the analyst or to the, 
CISO or to the board member. And so the customer's requirement here was that I want to see all of the manufacturers that I've got. I want to see the ones I know about. I want to see the ones I don't know about. And I want to see the devices that occasionally connect um, with, my, with my infrastructure. And so we are able to export data in standard format. You can import that into any of your preferred business intelligence tools. Uh, in another um, hospital environment, we were able to, again, very quickly apply the, the enrichment of device data to, make, to enable SOC teams to make very quick decisions. If you are at all familiar with you know, IPS or network traffic analysis systems, you will know that you get a source address and you get a destination address, and then you have to figure out what is the nature of that communication. With Armis, we'll tell you straight up, this is a medical device and it's in Riga and it's running urgent care medical software and it's just connected to livefastcasino.com, right? That was a significant event for a healthcare organization that was very quickly prioritized in the triage process. The other two examples are one of data privacy concerns, right? So I've got um, you know, a medical device, which is using standard medical protocols, um, which is normal, but unfortunately those protocols are unencrypted. And whilst they're in a controlled environment, I'm okay with that. But as soon as they're going to the guest network and I don't know the recipient device, I'm not okay with clear text protocols leaving my control boundaries, right? And so again, um, an event which would normally take days to resolve was instantly recognizable. And finally, the third one is again, another one of configuration errors. I've got a device here, which should only really be connected to the corporate network, but it's jumping between guest and corporate. And that could indicate what an, any number of things, but what it does do, um, it means that it shouldn't be happening. And I don't want this device connecting to the guest network. Um, another example here in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that I've highlighted drone, right? So in this particular example, we saw, you know, dash cams, lots of mobile phones, tablets, single board computers. Um, but the thing we've highlighted here is a drone. Now, most people think, well, okay, well, you know, drones are everywhere. You know, I'm not surprised that you saw a drone. It's just that this customer was an airport. Uh, and so a sort of a side use case came out that we were able to spot drones in their airspace, uh, which was, um, which was uh, unexpected. It wasn't why they used Armist, but it was a bonus for them. Um, how we've used this data over time is we now have really unprecedented visibility into the broadest spectrum of devices. I think we have profiles on about 11 or 12 million devices. We have 280 million devices that are tracked in real time. And this allows us to level set the risk. And um, we can tell you whether, you know, that IP camera um, in the boardroom is doing something different today that it hasn't done before compared to itself. We can tell you if that camera is doing something different compared to its peers in the same organization. And we can tell you if it's doing something different than its entire species across all of the customers. And so this machine learned profiling capability works where regardless of whether you, the device is agentable, manageable, um, OT, IT, IOT. Uh, and so this is really why organizations are turning to Armist now to help manage their risk in this new digitally transformed world. So that's the, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Andy, yes. thank you very much for your persuasive and emotional speech. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it, <laughs> At the end of the day, it was very cool. Thank you very much.
And uh, now I check uh, whether we have question from uh, the audience. Uh, I check the chat. Maybe somebody have questions, please uh, write uh, on the chat. We are ready to answer. I don't see any questions. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I late. agree. I am agree with you. Yeah. Okay, Andy, thank you very much. Uh, you today's speech very beautiful and very interesting presentation. Thank you very I much. think that my, our audience agree with me.